I'll hit start here and uh, oh, I just did it. Cool, beat you to Thank it. You. You're 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 on top of it today. All right, good morning, everyone. Uh, contrary to what I thought I was going to be doing when I got into drawing casual diagrams, which is I thought we were actually going to be drawing casual diagrams, uh, we did start actually taking a step further from last week with Aaron's uh, conversation, introducing us to what a causal diagram is, to understanding some of the key concepts and uh, considerations for building causal diagrams. So the actual drawing part of it is outside the scope of the book. Right now, what we're doing is focusing on understanding how we would draw it. Um, so we will have some time uh, later today, sorry, later, in the presentation uh, to explore through some of the packages and kind of talk through the documentation um, and the homework. So today will be a little bit shorter of a lecture or review slides and I'll update these in our package uh, later on um, and more so on kind of discussion and exploring through these. And there was some fun wording in this uh, in this chapter. Uh, I really liked his explanation of that you want something that causes something or something that is caused by something. And so there was a lot of different interesting ways, but really what it boiled down to is when we're drawing causal diagrams, we really want to start with assumptions that make sense, that are reasonable. And what this is, is that we're doing this a lot on based on prior knowledge, research, information that we are kind of bringing into it. And the idea here is that it's representing the data generating process. So we need to understand as much as that as possible. So this is that qualitative component of it, uh, subject matter expertise. Knowing something about it, we wouldn't be able to necessarily do this if we didn't have any prior information. We would kind of have to start with basic assumptions. Um, and some of the questions that will come up when you're trying to think about that is, you know, what leads us to observe the data that we do, what causes the outcome, and what causes the treatment. And I really liked his definition of what are variables, because when you break it down, variables are just measurements uh, that we're seeing. Uh, what you know, When we measure something, that's the value that we got. So very uh, conversational-based, quick definition of a variable. And in causal diagrams, we're really focusing on two main variable types. We have a treatment variable and the outcome variable. And the treatment variable is we want to know the effect of, and the outcome variable is what the effect on is. So in the example here where they talked about online classes and student dropout, the online classes would be the treatment variable because we're trying to understand the effect of live online classes on the outcome variable of being able to whether students drop a course or not. So again, a lot of this is built off of assumptions. And he did mention in there that at first you will probably have a more complex causal diagram. And that is a good starting point because then when you go through it, you can start to make it more simple. And it said sometimes uh, the less information is actually more information, but you don't want it to actually become too broad or too simple. So in the case of, of this, you don't want to necessarily expand to it and say, you know, that if you're looking at like a regional specific area, you don't want to say something generic about the entire world. And that's just is way too broad, but you also don't want to make it so complex that it's just too difficult to understand. So some ways that he proposed to keep it simple, but not necessarily too simple, um, are these four broad categories, which is once you have collected your assumptions and essentially put them connected uh, with the arrows to each other, um, you can start to remove or update your causal diagram as necessary. So the first thing he recommends is to find uh, variables that are unimportant. So if there's minimal connection or they don't even connect to the 
uh, outcome variable, those can be removed out of there. Um, one of the examples that he had put on there was that for students taking online classes that may be having the ability to go to a quiet coffee shop would be something that would impact whether or not students stayed in or enrolled or stayed in the course itself. However, it probably was not affecting everyone. It was mostly uh, focused just on a few in, uh, fewer subset of those. So that would be an example of, yeah, it's has some uh, importance, but it's not necessarily the a main one that we really wanna focus um, that would have impact students in general. Redundancy, same space. So if we see that we have uh, variables that are, are essentially saying the exact same thing, um, just reworded of each other, or they have the same uh, paths with nothing really different. So say if you start with A and then go to both B and C, and nothing comes in or out of B or C, and they both go to your outcome, you're not really doing much different between the two, and you could actually remove one. Um, or you might even no notice that that one in the middle is a, a mediator. So if A goes to B and B goes to C, it very well could be stated as A goes into C. There were some situations that he mentioned that this may not necessarily be the best way, um, but for the most part, if nothing comes in or out of B other than A, uh, it's kind of reducing it and just say, okay, A doesn't, A causes B and B causes C. Well, then the start of that causal relationship was that it was A and the end of it was C, so we could condense that down to A to C. The other interesting one that he had brought up about this um, is that we're going to be covering next week, which I believe Sarah has signed up for chapter eight, um, is when it's not even on a causal path. So this is where it's disconnected, not relevant, and he's going to present in chapter eight next week about some ways to identify those um, and to remove them. But for now, pretty much there are things that would be irrelevant or not um, on the uh, causal path that it has provided. I like yeah, I, I just 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 to add uh, something in the book. I, I think the author talked about like this gray area. Uh, mm -hmm. where, right, with available time and work hours or something like that um, in the example that he used. And he was showing, well, like, this is kind of like a mediator. This is kind of redundant, not exactly. So there's uh, definitely some artistic uh, choices to be had here. It's not always so um, black and white. Right. And, yeah, that's really what it boiled down to was that, you know, it, you have to be comfortable working with assumptions the idea here is that um, your goal of all of this is really not necessarily to have the correct answer, um, but it is to have um, the best answer uh, that's based off of the observable data. And so this, like you mentioned, is is kind of a general framework and it does take some a, t a lot of research ahead of time and it has to you have to make some assumptions and then you have to verify your assumptions or make adjustments this isn't a set it once and uh you're done um there will be opportunities or needs to adjust it so back to his original con uh, commentary about you know you have a you're going from a theory uh to a hypothesis that you want to be able to adjust it if need be. And this was a fun one. Um, I like his side comment about cycles are worse than punching someone, but don't punch people. Um, it was a fun example. Um, we're virtual, so we can't practice this, but to this point, we should probably not practice that at, at either. Um, but one of the things which is different than say, when you look at the street mathematics and you'll get uh, 
boiler circuits or um, things like that, where you can start and end on the same uh, vertex, um, everything. This one is in the causal diagrams. You can't start and end at the same variable. So what this would look like is an A to B relationship back to A, or sometimes it was a double arrow, which right here just to, so A causes B and B causes A. And intuitively that doesn't necessarily make sense, but he did find an example where that's possible. The other way that we can see the same variable is A to B, a causes B, which causes C, which causes A. I think about like a general triangle. Uh, we see those a lot of times in uh, frameworks, diagrams, and so on. But in this case, it is something that we should not see. So cycles where we start and end or the treatment variable and the outcome variable interchange. And the example provided in the book was if you've ever been a child, which I think most of us have, and you have a sibling or someone that you're close with, you know, you'll punch them and they'll punch you back and then you punch them and you go on. It makes sense that A, in this case, would be I punch you and B would be you punch me and then I punch you back. And even though there was um a treatment that I punch you and the outcome is you you punch me that there does need to be something that breaks that cycle which is the initial one for example of why I punched you in the first place <laughs> so um the example he provided there was that I was going to flip a coin and if I got a heads, for example, I would punch you and then you would punch me back and so on. So it wasn't necessarily that the start of that cycle was that I punch you. It's that the the coin flip causes, uh, causes whether I punch you or not. And then that causes whether you punch me back or not. And if we go back to our kind of general framework here of the mediators, I punch you is actually a mediator in that sense so we go from originally saying I punch you, and I'll bring this up in the book to you punch me. Um, we now have the flip coin. I punch you, you punch me. And I punch you here as a mediator. So we can break this cycle by basically saying that um, I flip a coin and the, and the outcome of that is what leads to you punching me. It was a fairly short chapter um, and high level pretty much saying, hey, you, you have to make assumptions. We go back and revisit our data generating process, make sure we fully understand that. And that is what this is representing is um, the measurements that we're seeing and getting in the data generating process, which is the basis of our research design moving forward and understanding the causal relations, that's what we're going to use to then generate these. Now, there will be tools that are available um, and which Aaron had introduced us to, it was, was it? Gigi Dag. Gigi Dag, yeah. Um, and he did represent a website in there, Daggity, um, which when I first typed it in, I ended up on like some spam site. Uh, you might want to Google it, but daggity.net, so I probably spelled it wrong. Um, but there was a lot of great ways you could learn about them. Uh, you can actually create some in your browser um, and then go through some of the code and we can go through these uh, how you all see fit. Um, but down here towards the bottom, there's a GG DAG right here that went through um, and DAG, DAG R is one that is also there. Um, and you can also practice the rules of this in a browser through uh, Shiny apps where you can actually determine whether or not what adjustments that need to be made on here uh, versus the one. But before we go into that, uh, did anyone want to add anything from the chapter? I may have uh, 
glanced over you thought was important um, to add on or? Yeah, yeah, I, I do. Um, specifically to your uh, point about avoiding cycles, uh, one of the, the later sections in this chapter, um, you know, like, I, I don't think the author's using the term DAG, right? But these causal diagrams are, are DAGs and that's the A there stands for acyclic, right? Which is no loops. Um, that is a, a problem, not just specific to causal inference. I, I think, you know, you look at graph theory, um, other mathematical problems when you have loops where, where you're stuck in a loop, uh, you end up having mathematically intractable problems. So you need <laughs> tools to get out of that. Um, I think about um, Google's page rank, rank algorithm. Like mm -hmm. I, I'm into like sports ranking. So I, <laughs> it's actually like the page rank algorithm algorithm is, is kind of handy for understanding how a lot of like sports ranking things uh, work. And uh, that's a, a problem with ranking web pages, you know, where you have web pages linking to others, you know, so there's inbound and outbound kind of links happening here, but you can end up in a cycle where you're kind of stuck in this in, um, finite universe of web pages and, um, one way to break out of this, this loop is to in, insert randomness. Um, so you can get from one web page to any other web page theoretically, just by introducing a small amount of randomness. Um, and in doing so, you know, whatever math problem you're trying to solve and, and here, maybe ranking a web page, uh, it becomes tractable, um, by breaking the loop kind of artificially through, through this randomness. So you know, it was interesting. The author just talks about random coin flip. And I think, you know, that problem actually is very interesting when you, when you study the underlying mathematics behind it. And again, loops, loops tend to be a problem or cycles. So, so you need to break it. And, uh, and, and I think that the coin flip is his way of saying that's how you break out of the, the loop. Yeah. Thank you for um, adding in that in there. I, um, I've been working a lot with circuits and everything, which is, you know, you, you want that loop. Uh, so um, I think that's a, that's a good one. And that, would you say that the majority of, I guess, target audience for this book and, and the research would need to understand the details behind it or is having that surface thing knowledge of basically I can't control or I can't lead have a cycle be significant less uh, sufficient. Yeah, I, I mean, I don't think we really need to know much beyond cycles are bad or loops are bad uh, here. It just, you know, reading through this this chapter, it just made me think of like page rank, for instance. Um, again, they're just math problems where you have have loops and you can't you can't solve what you want to solve for unless you uh, break the cycle. And and that's exactly what he's talking about from a conceptual standpoint here. Um, so you know, I, I just think for our purposes, as long as we know that if we have a DAG with a cycle, that's a that's a problem. <laughs> that should be should be enough here. And it sounds like there are there are multiple tricks you can apply. I'm not you know I'm not that well versed in DAGs, but um, you know he talked about the the temporal aspect. Mm -hmm. It's just one way to to break out of it, and then the other way was with the coin flip. Yeah, and and he does say in here that you know common approach. So there are quite a different a variety of ways, but um, you know even if there still remains cycle like elements, um, you know you'll have to kind of approach. But this is just one of um, other approaches, but the main goal is to make sure that you're looking through and identifying where that may happen and how you may have to update that. So that's interesting to know about the randomness and, um, yeah. And I see Derek put, put in something yeah, in the chat there as well. So he, he's probably, he's familiar with that to a degree. And uh, do you have any examples on the stopiac stick processes that, um, approaches or anything that is handled in that way? Uh, no, it's been several years since I taught that class, and the examples Aaron provided are quite sufficient. Okay. Uh, I I I uh, will be like, hey, I, I I did that last week, and then 
it's been a while since I've been able to do it. So I appreciate after years that you're still able to bring it up, but uh, thanks for sharing on that. Great. Um, yeah, so I wanted to show, this was the one chart uh, with the triangle in here. I think this is a lot better of a representation than my power, uh, PowerPoint, but uh, these in different aspects seem to make sense, but not in a causal diagram. So like when you think about like the, the data life cycle or something, it's like business um, uh, need, the analysis, uh, the outcome stakeholders, and you kind of go in that process there of, um, and uh, things like that. But as we look through the, where we began in this one, where we talked about all the potential variables that could impact whether somebody enrolls in an online class or drops out, we have a pretty complex one here. And if you think about just on a simple one of online classes uh, lead to dropout, that's a, that's a pretty messy chart as it begins with. And you start to look through here, uh, SCS is social economic uh, situation, that there seems to be some that tend to say the same thing or very near to the same thing. But we really um, can start breaking this down using those four with the framework. So when we look about uh, the first ones of things of like unimportant, we can look to see, you know, for example, that um, if there's one that either might not be very important uh, for the overall, we could drop those. Um, so like, um, we'll see how we go through that. Actually, what I'm gonna do is put these side by side so we can compare them next to each other. And I'm sorry, I'm currently getting yelled at by my daughter because I happen to eat her leftover cookie that she left out last night. Um, all right, so let me zoom in here a little bit. Yes. Can you all see that enough to be able to read it between the two? Yep. Okay. Um, yep, so as you can see, we're saying essentially the same thing, focusing on the uh, causal diagram. And we're maintaining the same outcome and treatment um, that causal components, focusing on the most important ones, getting rid of uh, redundancy. And you can see just looking in between the two that if you had to kind of figure out this this diagram, the one on the right seems to be a bit more easy and intuitive to interpret and understand. And that's the goal of these as well, is that you know when you put it into a diagram, it should be a more simple representation of more complex op options here. So the goal on this one is to look through and identify uh, those some of those four components. So when we look at unimportance, does anyone see um, one that's unimportant and how you can identify what that actually looks like on, on this chart on the left? All right, um, and I don't believe we have to do those in order, 
So as we we're kind of thinking through it, we can we can go there as well. So the main ones that we're 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 seeing a lot of information leading uh, causing would be the work hours preferences and having their location. So if we look from on the left location to internet access to online class, we can see that there's nothing coming in and out of, or sorry, out of internet access. So that internet access there is a mediator. And that way, when we look on the chart on the right in our more cleaned up version of it, we're able to drop that and actually connect location directly to an online class. When we look at something like the preferences, we are able to actually see that doesn't really, a lot of those are very similar concepts to um, overlapping the same thing. And really preferences is le what leads into um, whether or not they sign up for an online class that is the only place that that is there. So if we break this down into, okay, which of those may be um, stronger or relevant because preferences in this case is all um, like a mediator. We see that age and SCS are actually a cycle. So we need to be able to identify that that's a cycle there and figure out how we can still incorporate these because from our assumptions, age is important. Uh, more access, people coming back to school versus being their first time in SDS. Um, so we need to figure out a way to break that cycle. And the way that he, um, to actually break that cycle is to remove them from being part of preferences and focus on the age as a treatment variable onto SES, uh, which then leads to online classes. So both age to online class and age to um, social economic status. So we'll have to kind of figure that one out a little bit more, um, but that is one assumption that he had put in there um, was to break that cycle there. And looking through this a bit more, we do see that we're having impacts of these treatment variables causing other ones, uh, which is causing that redundancy of, hey, we don't necessarily need to uh, know that race is a preference and available time or that um, gender leads into SES and preferences, we could reduce those down as well. But where did we get all of our initial thoughts from? We put in assumptions. We thought that these were ones that would cause it. We say what the treatment variable is, what the outcome variable is. And then all we are doing is drawing lines uh, between the different, I guess, arrows, um, treatment variable into each of the outcome variables. And in this case, it did seem like a lot of our assumptions pointed to uh, different areas that could have been removed. Any questions or anything that anyone wanted to bring up? more detail on this part. No, I think you explained it pretty well. I mean, yeah, I'd be certainly combining things like um, gender and, and, and race makes sense uh, as a just kind of one, one bucket demographics, right? Because you had the same arrows kind of going in and out of both of those. Awesome. Yeah, it, it's one of those things that like when I'm reading, I'm like, oh, yeah, that makes sense. But then when I'm trying to explain it, I'm like, wait, why does that make sense? So it's kind of good to uh, revisit through those. But yeah, so this is 
this is going to follow us through into next week when we actually talk about the casual pass where we're going to um, better understand how we can understand the relevant uh, uh, variables and, and, and make our causal diagrams uh, better, I guess, if you will, but be able to identify and explain when we see, we see or how we could interpret something being irrelevant. Um, so any questions or any other thoughts from anyone before we kind of walk through some of the homework or you all prefer to walk through some of the uh, resources on Daggety. Yeah, no, no more uh, uh, comments on my end. Uh, I'm, I'm okay kind of going to either, either approach here if you want to go through the homework, but I, I don't know much about Daggety. Um, okay. You know, when, uh, I don't know. I'm, I'm curious what you learned there. Yeah, I, I thought this would be a, a good one for us to kind of explore to, uh, kind of together through the documentation, seeing if anyone has any experience or um, gone through here. But uh, what I gathered from Daggety is it's really just a, a general hub for interactive and tools that you can build these off of. Um, so there's interactive tutorials and examples, uh, video tutorials with somebody that looks extremely familiar. <laughs> uh, so I guess he's a contributor on here. Yep. And then there's some additional reading and so on here. Um, they actually have a game here, which is always fun. Um, yeah, but we're talking about variables we have, or uh, terms we haven't necessarily gone over yet inside of here. Uh, but we can see child parent are uh, different ways that we can also talk about those. Um, there is this cheat sheet. Which I'm going to close out of this one for now so it can go full screen. Um, that talks about less about the understanding how to get to one, but some of the ones that uh, how to actually go through here and build them inside of here on um, as you're, you're you're learning through them uh, and you can actually once you've built them in here you do have an option to export the code that built this to use um, so as you're learning it will help do that for you uh, so i'm someone who likes to drag point and click and kind of visualize things before trying to build code to visualize something um, this is helpful uh, for me um, so I think when we start getting into the front doors and back doors, I, this will probably be a bit more uh, intuitive as we go through here. Uh, but as you can see here, this was, I think, his previous book or one of the books he had mentioned in there. Um, and then there's also the manual here that goes a bit further into if you need to provide some different views, effect analysis, um, which is kind of what we're talking about as well. Um, but yeah, so it's um, Daggety itself is a browser based one, but there is uh, a, a lot more uh, in here that would be helpful. Video tutorials. Doesn't say whether they have music in the background or not, but hopefully that's there. Um, So I think we have uh, a waiting towards social scientists. So I guess this paper is no longer linked here, but there are some ones for different ones there. Um, now, if we go to GDDAG, which is what was shown last week, and you were explaining before we got started, Karen, that it you mentioned that it, it creates a gg plot but just as in the shape of a dag do you recall what you were mentioning about that yeah i mean that yeah this is it is gg plot that i mean that's what it's it's harnessing there and in fact if you don't change the theme uh t 
to like theme dag or theme minimal i mean it looks like the standard kind of grayish background that you get with with ggplot at, at default so it, it's it's sort of a wrapper package Check on top out. of ggplot so you know right so you don't have to do all of the you you could theoretically build all this with ggplot but with you know many more lines of code hmm. got it okay and was last week kind of your first time exploring through this or have you yeah before okay yeah i just kind of hacked my way through it Stack the, Overflow the, was my my friend. Of Stack Overflow, as I say, it was the was the documentation sufficient, or go elsewhere. Yeah, it was. I think where I struggled is I was trying to replicate, you know, how the author uses kind of grayed out um, nodes and edges. Uh, I think is that for the unobserved variables, and I was really struggling to do that in ggdag, but at the end of the day, I, I just don't think that's the approach that's used there. So they use different colors. Um, and, and, and kind of the examples you're showing there, it's pretty pretty easy to do, to, to use different colors for the for the different nodes. Definitely, yeah, because you see this Y here, we'll get the parent child. And then here is where you were mentioning about the ggplot, making sure to update the theme. Awesome. Let's see, there was another one. This is, I guess, more on the paper here, but. Uh, This one might be a little less user friendly on this, but we'll see here. Uh, so this is one that was built as part of that paper. Uh, and this one looks like quite a bit going on behind the scenes there, but this is another example of one that's on there. Um, and then Jupiter, let's see, is this, okay. So this is, uh, a note, uh, Jupiter notebook. It looks like it's in Python, but I see also, yeah. So I guess you could do this in Python or, or inside of it. Um, but again, another way that you can, you can either, uh, display these in here that you've already created them or you can actually build them. I'm sorry, rendering them. Um, so if you've built them elsewhere and you want to put them inside of a, a walkthrough or something, you could you could do them uh, using this one as well. Right, if I understand correctly with Daggity Net, right, you can draw your your dag there get some code output and then copy paste that in r right yes isn't that um, so isn't that the code know, comes out the, over here right you paste that in your r script exactly yes so you can build these out kind of get an yeah. idea of how that relationship and the weights uh the positions are and then mm -hmm. you can store that and then render it elsewhere, or you can just render it directly in where you're at, depending on what's there. Um, so there's some pre-built ones in here, so you can kind of see there um, as well. So yeah, it's it's about being able to interact and play around and learn with these. The one that also was uh, interesting was the uh, daggle here. <laughs> which um, you're talking a little bit more about how to actually make changes to ones here so that you're doing something. I haven't fully gone through this one, um, but it looks like you can generate different DAGs with uh, different outcomes and so on. 
Um, so you can see that you can adjust based on this one to do something else here. Yes. So I think it, these resources will become a little bit better understood as we get into the next uh, chapters, but it's definitely a good thing to start playing around with. Um, have fun and play the games on here, but not get in trouble at work because you're actually learning. So um, that would be good. There is the package directly um, as an R code as well. And they're really um, graphic user interfaces that will do what's on here. So if you don't want to do it in your browser, but maybe you want to do, do it inside of a website yourself or your code, you can you can actually have this in your rendered code rather than coming to the site outside of it. Okay. So I think unless there's any topics anyone wanted to cover, I figure the last 10, 15 minutes we can kind of look through some of these questions, see if there's any areas we may want to um, I think this would actually be a good one for us to have as a overall conversation because this one's more I'm thinking of just ways that we may see whether that's in our assumptions or actually on a on a DAG itself of these kind of situations that we could use to simplify. So any think of ways that we could identify unimportant variables on a DAG or in general with the causal diagrams and our assumptions. Um, well, I, I mean, I thought, you know, if, if the variable doesn't affect Affect your treatment or your outcome. By definition, it, I would think that would be unimportant, right? And I know we haven't gone fully into irrelevance, but how would that be different than irrelevant? That's uh, that's a good <laughs> good point. I, as you were displaying the list, I was thinking of my. Interchange. Am I am I uh, misinterpreting irrelevance versus unimportance? I'm looking through the chapter now. Yeah, I gather that un unimportance is really about. I think. Yeah, now that I look at it, unimportance is really about the magnitude of the effect. And so, yeah, yeah I gather too. Yeah. So right. So yes, this is part of the data generating process. But based on your research, uh, prior knowledge, you could say, well, this this does not make a you know, a, a big, uh, a big impact here overall. Therefore we, you know, to simplify, we can just remove it all together. I guess where I was thinking was, was literally like, yeah, here's a variable that maybe is part of the part of this world that you're trying to model, but it, if it doesn't impact the treatment or outcome, would we call that irrelevant then? Yeah, I think that would be something that is not connected versus it's connected, yeah. but it's not necessarily. Yeah. It's, I think it's going back to his concept of, you know, you could spend all day thinking of every potential way that could be causing this and have, you know, all these complex variables. But at the end of the day, we should recognize or see that some variables seem to be, um, have a, more defined or a greater magnitude, as you put it, impact um, that we could really actually move forward with on a research. Yeah, so I guess really that, that because we haven't talked about magnitude yet on the actual one, but he did kind of allude to the, uh, you know, the, the thinner arrows or something like that. So, I, I believe that this would still have to be based off of assumptions um, and kind of your your research ahead of time. Like, um, yeah, this I guess it's like you know if, when you're going to buy a car, for example, um, you know, some people buy it because you know they 
grew up with that type of car, but that isn't probably the overall reason why people buy cars. Um, you know, it might be the need, it might be the uh, safety aspect of it or something like that. But like nostalgia, it's probably not a as important of a re re reason why people would buy cars. Um, so I think that that would maybe be a okay example of that. But again, that that does, you do, you do need to have some understanding of that to make that assumption and very well might have to readjust and realize, hey, actually it was, but um, I, I think the purpose of this is really to naturally see like, hey, there's more important things that we've observed or done through our research that we could focus on. The redundancy one's going to take a bit for me because I, it, I do get in that cyclical thing. It's like, well, this is part of this and that can be part of this and back and forth and really trying to best understand when it is redundant versus not. So for example, the age and the SCS and the other one, it's like we didn't remove them from the um, the DAG. We just split, we kind of separated them into different ways. So that one's probably going to take a little bit for me to understand, but anybody have any situations or examples of where that might, what that looked like or how you would think through that? Yeah, I mean, I, I agree. It's it's a little bit confusing. Um, I again think back to like the demographics example where you could combine age, race, gender together as all being part of demographics. Um, but you know, I'm trying to tie that back to like a model that you might build a regression model, and and you probably, I mean, depending on the situation, you you may not combine those together as one variable. I mean, you could, but you know, a lot of times like age and gender, for instance, would be modeled separately as covariates. And so I, I think just just because you're combining these variables together in the DAG doesn't mean that you're getting rid of the variables from a or combining them in the model, I think, right? Um, I, I think it, it, this is all about the causal pathway and right. and it's it's about, you know, just simplifying where you can. It's it's not necessarily getting rid of the variables. Uh or again, combining them in the in your your actual physical or the, the model that you're building um to establish the strength of, of relationships here. Yeah, and that and that makes sense. I I guess for me it would be something like if each one of these is part of this, would it be redundant to have them separate? and combined versus just basically keeping it as SES, removing the mm -hmm. things that go into it. And I guess that kind of goes back to the making it too broad because there's a lot of other components of SES and these are the, maybe the main three. Um, but overall, like gender, race, and age may be the most important of those, but there are other factors within it that could be so... I think I'll come with practice. The other thing that I'm quite, uh, I guess, unsure about is these unseen variables and when to include them or start them at that point rather than others. So like, for example, for me, I don't intuitively think of there needing to be a causal relationship that leads to where somebody is located. Now I understand that there could be, you know, their work or other things, but kind of what we gather from that, that we don't, or that we don't already have with the observed ones. Um, just to talk a little bit more about redundance, I was thinking that in the data, it usually comes up in collinear data or highly correlated data. For example, if you say, um, which people own a mansion and which people only golf club membership, it probably is about the same crowd. So that might be how we think about redundance. Okay. Yeah. Um, so basically two two or more variables that are pretty much saying the same thing, but just different angles of the same one. So um, 
that would be a good one now would you generally check for that before or after putting those assumptions into a DAG? Yeah, some somewhat mathematical approach. Uh, you would check for the the correlations. You might you yeah you might check the so called vectors and see if they like you said basically point in the same direction. Uh, okay. Yeah, I think um, I think this is a case where your your knowledge of the system you're interested in comes into play because in in the um, the sort of so socioeconomic status example, like you could you can refer to past literature that shows that there was a high correlation between your race and your social socioeconomic status or your gender and your socioeconomic status. Um, and you can sort of use that really high collinearity that other studies have found in order to justify your uh, sort of collapsing of those into a single variable. Uh, that, that's a good point. Thank you. I, when I mentioned about doing the research, I hadn't thought about people have probably already done research to talk about this, but that's a good point on that is that, you know, you can use other people's findings uh, as part of your, your um, building this out as well. So thanks for contributing that. I know we have just a few minutes left. Is there anything, I think we kind of mentioned the mediators uh, here in general, and then the relevance will save for next week when Sarah enlightens us now, better understand the difference between unimportance and irrelevance and how that fits in everything. Um, but yeah, just a uh, shorter chapter. I was surprised. Um, it's only about... 10 pages or so, uh, but moving into next week, uh, we're going to chapter eight and that gives us three more, I guess we have three more weeks, four more weeks of the first part of the book before we actually get into the toolbox where we'll be building out the models themselves. Um, I don't think we have anyone signed up for, not this week, but next week uh, or the following week, uh, chapter nine. So if you, uh, have interest in volunteering. Uh, I know. I signed up for it last night. So, okay, yeah. so we're pretty yeah. much covered through the rest of this first part of the book. Uh, Cause I think Aaron, you set up for 10 and I signed up for 11 so that we're pretty set for the next couple of weeks. But as you're starting to look through the toolbox, if there's ones that you really want to do a deeper dive in or um, volunteer, um, you know, a bit, just, start to be a bit of a difference where we go through more of that toolbox and actually showing code and walking through the stuff more so than the concept. But um, I, I do appreciate how this book is set up with really getting a chance to fully understand the why before we focus on how, um, which is which is great. But with that, oh, we're right up on time. I think we have like a minute or two, but if anyone wants to share anything, did it was anyone able to go to the... Um, was it posit, posit the conference last week or any interesting outcomes from that that you've been seeing floating around? Um, I just have an admin thing, I guess, before we okay, talk yeah. about it. Um, we have a skip for daylight savings on October 16th, but at least where I am, I'm pretty sure daylight savings time is November 3rd. Hmm. So we might want to check when we actually are doing the daylight savings switch that makes sense you're a lot more forward looking than i am i don't think i've gotten out of the month of august uh <laughs> in early september but yeah i'll take a look on that i i guess from other people's experiences is, is that it sounds like i can make the adjustments myself but is yeah it's usually with the first weekend in november um as well but but Historically, it was because we had a lot of, of an international audience in different countries change their clocks at different weeks. Got it. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Thanks for bringing that to my attention. Uh, we just had that uh, or skip in PDL. So we'll have to see, just confirm how that was handled and make that adjustment as well. Awesome. Well, thank you all for attending. It's great to see. Uh, 
bit larger of an audience. And, uh, you know, if anything comes up or as you're exploring through, we've got the Slack channel. Uh, other than that, thanks for participate participation. Look forward to uh, hearing what's next uh, about understanding the um, causal paths. Have a great, great day, everyone. Talk to you all next week. Thanks, John. Appreciate Thanks, it. John.